Anjali ji, welcome to Chandigarh Lalit Kala Academy. Uh, Thank you. Since you have come during Amrita Shergill National Week celebration, uh, I would like to begin with uh, what are the parallels you find with uh, Amrita's life? Well, Amrita was, when I was a very young girl, I used to spend at least one day a week at the National Gallery of Modern Art, though I was in college in Delhi, uh, just gazing at the Shergills. Uh, and they were in wonderful condition in those days. I think later on they were varnished uh, very badly by some wandering Italian, I believe. And now the, a lot of them are in bad condition. They're cracked and all that. But I saw them in their pris at their pristine best. And there's no doubt I was completely and totally influenced uh, and mesmerized uh, by the Shergill paintings. So uh, I think there are certain, I, even critics have drawn certain parallels between our work. Mm -hmm except that uh, we lived at different times and uh, by the time I began to paint, which was long after Amrita uh, had passed away, uh, there was more scope for what I'd call expressionism and the imagination uh, than there was in Shergill's time. Uh, what, what Shergill had really done was to, especially in her Indian uh, uh, phase, which was her greatest phase, uh, when she went down south and uh, all her Punjab paintings. Uh, she was viewing uh, reality uh, through the lens of her own uh, eyes and with her great painterly skills. But she wasn't adding any um, either bizarre or different elements to it. There was a little less interpretation. But there are many things uh, about her. I mean, she was a great colorist. And the kind of stillness in her work has continued to influence me even now. Uh, my, works, uh, my work is also rather still, uh, as Shergill's is. Um, but I, I, I continue to think that the bedrock of Indian contemporary art or Indian modern art was very much Shergill. You have uh, gone through several uh, phases uh, mm -hmm. of your creative evolution. I would like you to talk about that and where do you find yourself now? Well, for the first time, let's start from now and then go backwards, yeah. okay? okay. Uh, for the first time, I'm interested in the figure that moves or flies. Uh, till now, my work, especially in the figurative work, has been extremely grounded. Um, an almost full frontal uh, iconic. The other great influence of my life uh, has been uh, early Christian art uh, and the Byzantine. Uh, the kind of uh, influence of icons and their techniques, which again involved this full frontal uh, gaze of, of the uh, protagonist in the painting and also a certain color palette which derived from those early, early experiences of uh, 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 Christian art and of my work as a frescist uh, at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris where I studied fresco. Uh, so those, the, the, the techniques in, in both those and maybe the kind of vision of Shergill, these were the three great influences when I was painting at the age of 18, 19, uh, do, did show in that early work. Let's talk about your other phases as well. Now, in between, there was a hiatus of almost about 10 years where I had, you see what happens is, and I think this, that this is true, there was, this was true of Frida Kahlo, this was tr tr true of many women painters, that your world is a bit smaller. And I, for one, never uh, aspired to do, I, uh, to do heroic paintings of great events or battles or mythology. Uh, they were uh, essentially almost always single figures. I remained a figurative painter through the whole phase when abstraction was in, in uh, favor. Uh, and I've been always considered somewhat of a maverick that I did not belong to any school. I rebelled against everything that was happening at the time. Uh, and I continue to do that. But in doing so, later on, uh, I felt that I was 
uh, every experiment or digression that I made seemed to have a following. And uh, during those 10 years, I made many, many digressions from the original work that I had become well known for. Because I've often said that perhaps the worst enemies of progress for an artist are the one's admirers. <laughs> because uh, I call it the Hussein's horse syndrome, <laughs> where your admirers pin you down to the work that they like uh, and prevent you from moving forward. So you have to have a lot of courage to abandon each phase in looking for something else. And I've also said that the artist's struggle consisted not uh, of the struggle in the garret, not of uh, the poverty and um, which artist struggle is often interpreted as. It's true, we've been through that as well. I've been through years of not having enough money even for a frame, uh, of starving it out in Paris and so on. But that wasn't the artist struggle. The artist struggle consists of being able to make these transitions from one phase to the other. And you sometimes hit a wall. To climb that wall and find light at the other end of the wall is, that is the struggle. Because it's very easy to get mired in some kind of successful genre that you might have hit, either by mistake or by influence. And then uh, uh, you don't have the courage to abandon it and go somewhere else. So I spent almost 10 years in this, what I call this experimental phase, because I realized that many of the symbols that I had created from ev everyday objects, the glass, the pair of specks, the window, the dog, the crow. children, the crow, the toys as my children grew up, uh, their toys became objects in the paintings. But by repeating a certain symbol, it became a cliché. The clichés of one's own making. And uh, so th the attempt to abandon that or to turn one's back on it was very deliberate. And uh, during this phase, I first started with, uh, what did I start with? It was the, around uh, the 90s, I had the e exhibition called Follies in Fantastical Furniture, where I picked up old junked objects, resurrected them uh, with paint. And this actually was the, almost the direct opposite of what I'd call installation art today. Because installation art, by and large consists of assemblages or installations of stuff that is almost doomed uh, to be trashed afterwards because very few installations really find a permanent home and it's, it's, it was started in America which is a land of waste whereas in India we've never wasted anything we are great retrievers of stuff here, hoarders and my uh, exhibition of f fantastical furniture was very much in that spirit that you find old things. And I always quoted the Kantha, which is just made out of old saris. They never even, the women who made those amazing works of art didn't even have the money to buy thread. All they had, their only tool was one needle. They used to pull the colored threads from the border, wind them out carefully and make threads with which to work. Uh, and the sari was, was, uh, was quilted in layers. So nothing was wasted. And out of waste, we have a tradition of creating great things. So that uh, exhibition was about, there were old suitcases, refrigerators. And for the first time also, I felt at that stage that Indian art took itself extremely seriously. And it was very serious. Uh, al already in the West, People had turned to satire, humor, uh, angst, pain, lots of other things rather than beauty were being expressed. Beauty had almost become a dirty word. And uh, this exhibition made people laugh. Uh, it was a bit frivolous uh, in content, but uh, behind it was a certain seriousness of purpose where I wanted to emphasize that uh, it's not only things that hang on a wall that constitute art. Of course, that has become almost the norm now because there's hardly any uh, painting being done. It's all things that don't hang on a wall. Uh, so that exhibition, but inadvertently, I also created the first installation at that without knowing that it was an installation, without giving it a name. And I think perhaps I was the first uh, Indian artist to 
do an installation, it was because when I was faced with all these huge objects, cupboards and tables and chairs, many chairs, um, they were, half of them were in Chennai and half were in Delhi and we had to take them to Jahangirat Gallery. And I was appalled at the amount of waste that we would, plastic waste that we would generate. So I had the idea that we'd go and buy some uh, resais. And I bought a hundred resais in bright, gaudy colors. And each object was wrapped in a resai. So when the exhibition opened, it is the round gallery of Jahangir Art Gallery. All these resais, I had no way to keep them in the meanwhile. So they were all piled in the center of the gallery. And it became the sort of sitting point. Lovers sat on it, holding hands. Children dived into it. And that really became the first installation. After that, uh, I think there was this engagement with kitsch because I wanted to bridge the gap between so-called high art and the calendar art, the art of the street, the art of the circus. And so there were a whole series of paintings on those subjects. Uh, and using the kitsch uh, elements combined with my own style. So sometimes you'd have, uh, the first exhibition I did, uh, it was in Paris, it was with collages cut from calendars. But the later exhibition where I did much larger works were actually painted uh, in the kitsch style uh, using elements from calendar art and also using elements from the circus. And the third uh, input was uh, to use the, the, the gold that is used in Tanjo paintings, but in a contemporary manner, like the specks of the guy would be made of Tanjo gold. Or uh, there's, a, there's one painting in which there's a saw cutting a chap in half, as they do in the circus, and that saw has real silver on it. So that was fun, using uh, different uh, elements and different media. I then got a uh, wonderful opportunity to go. I'd never been a sculptor because we led, led a very, very uh, peripatetic life, always traveling. I changed 30 houses in my married life. Uh, there was no place that I could sculpt. And uh, then I was offered this opportunity to go to Murano in Italy and make sculptures in glass. So I had two very major exhibitions of that, uh, one in the National Gallery. Uh, in Bombay uh, and we called it the sacred prism but it was such an amazing experience to have to be able to have the third dimension now you know paintings are two-dimensional and I've always I had always worked in this but I think the work with the furniture had inspired me to do things that were three-dimensional and then there was a fourth dimension of light, which was, that was the big surprise, that if you saw these glass sculptures through light, um, or had light behind them, uh, you could do all kinds of uh, different things just using the light. So there was that. And I think I was also perhaps the first Indian painter to uh, attempt to use the new technology. And uh, uh, there, there was an exhibition called The Mutations, mm -hmm. which was held in New York. And that consisted of uh, using a computer. What I did was I would morph three paintings uh, of mine, overlap them. Say one from the 70s, one from the 90s, and one from the 60s. And uh, creating a new image. Because after all, uh, art is about creating a new image whatever means you might employ. You might um, uh, cover yourself in paint and roll on a canvas. And uh, you might use photography. You, there, there are so many options. And I think that's what I find now with the young artists, that they have all those options. Many more options than we did. It was not just canvas and paint. Uh, they have uh, access to this technology. But I think I was the first one to do it. It was not very well received in India. People say, oh, this is a computer-aided work and so on. But it was a big hit in New York. It did very well, the exhibition. Um, and one very large uh, Pentic uh, with five panels was acquired by the National Gallery here. Uh, yeah, I mean, in uh, Delhi. Yeah. I thought I was in Delhi. <laughs> 
Uh, I would like you to talk about where do you find Indian art now? Um, recently in this India Art Fair, one began to think that uh, is Indian aesthetics going to be reinterpreted? What are the materials? I mean, you don't find uh, much of canvas art now any longer, as you rightly said. No, I think I think in this year's art fair, yes, that was true in the last two art fairs where, and certainly in the if you go to the Paris Biennale or the Venice Biennale, there's hardly any painting yes. done, or which was in between derog almost derogatively termed easel painters. We were called easel painters, and but this time I saw a, a movement back to uh, painting but these at the were art fair. mostly of the masters who have created uh, well the masters well i think that is that uh, there lies the great debate because what will survive what will survive i think that's so important to know and i think that you need maybe i won't survive maybe uh, i i see many of the painters who were so important in the 50s um, they're not even spoken of today uh, so, I think it's cyclical too, mm -hmm. it's very cyclical, uh, that there are phases and cycles in art. But I see a new genre emerging with the youngsters, which is very interesting. In fact, it is based in painting. And that, I call it um, super realist bizarre. Okay. Okay? <laughs> because, again, once again, mm -hmm. realism has become very important. I mean, the little figures or... Uh, figurative work that they create is beautifully wrought. It is almost photographic in its perfection, but it has to have a twist. You have to have a donkey with a man's head or a man with a donkey's head. You have to have um, the juxtapositions of the objects that are painted have to be bizarre in order to, for that work to be accepted in I mean, I'd say narrowly in these two years, uh, this John has, if you look at it, many of the youngsters are painting in that genre. Uh, for instance, I saw wonderful work. I've just been in an art camp and I go because I want to see what the youngsters are doing. Wonderful work by Irana, where it's almost a classical work. He paints very well. Uh, there's a whole group of monks. But there's a helicopter flying about to land. So that juxtaposition of the ancient and then something so as modern and urban as a helicopter are introduced within the same work. Uh, of course, there's a lot of didactic work as well, uh, where the message is so important to youngsters. Yes. And I have a little reservation, I have two reservations about didactic art as being practiced by the youngsters. The first is that the painting, uh, when it has a message, the message must come through in the visual, because the artist is not going to be standing there to explain. Those that rely on text may as well just be text. The second point about didactic art is where these great messages are being uh, transmitted through art, who are we addressing? We have to ask that question. The artist has to ask, I ask these youngsters many anyway, when you're painting this thing about the rape or about the tsunami or whatever, who are you addressing? Are you addressing uh, the already initiated? Uh, are we just scratching each other's back? Or are you going to be addressing the people who need that message? And uh, I have my doubts. I think today we have a great new media, uh, both the print media and certainly television. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to a certain extent now, uh, cell phones and, and, and Twitter. Yeah. Uh, to spread messages to a vast number of people. After all, how many people come to an art exhibition or are going to be affected by that message? And the people who are coming are already affected by the message, generally. Uh, there are very few people who uh, are not initiated. So that's one argument against, against the youngsters who are doing didactic work. And uh, the conceptual work, which uh, has textual messages running across the painting, yes. Uh, again, those are often bizarre. Uh, there seems to be a need to give bizarre titles and to have bizarre texts which don't actually make uh, any logical sense. They're not meant to. You find a lot of noise factor actually in many mm -hmm. works. Mm -hmm. So the, one doesn't really know where, which way is it heading. I hmm. uh, would like to understand uh, you left 
JJ School of Art mm -hmm. because you found that um, the way you know the colonial uh, yes. influence was there. Yes, too much. Yes. What is happening in our art education? Because that's a very important thing for. Well, the there has been a phase, you see, where they went to art schools and said, "Oh, we are not." I mean, I went to give a workshop or lecture at uh, Baroda, mm -hmm. which is the hotbed of uh, this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, I said I saw the final year work. Uh, which was happened to be exhibited at the time. And I found that, I said, hey, you guys have been here for five years. This is MFA work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do see in these paintings a certain lack of technique. Uh, you know, the application of paint, mm -hmm. uh, the, the certain norms of composition, the application of when to put more in seed, those technical things that artists learn in art schools. Sometimes a drawing. Uh, and this youngster gets up in the audience and says, we are not interested in technology, uh, in technology or techniques. Mm. We are only interested in ideology. So uh, it's very ideologically driven, uh, a lot of work that they're doing. And uh, so they miss out on those, those five years when they should be learning the basics. You can always shed the basics later, but I think it is rather necessary. Either you have to be self-taught and learn those basics, mm -hmm. or you have to go to school and learn it. Uh, things like tone and light and shade and how to use certain pigments. Um, the properties of, say, just blue. There are 18 shades of blue, 18 kinds of blue. Some are opaque, some are uh, transparent. So unless... Uh, Artists go through that grind, I think they're lacking something. So I'm trying to understand uh, with so much of globalization of everything, mm. all young artists now, they aspire to show abroad. Mm. And they aspire to create art, not really paint art, the way others are doing in other countries. Mm -hmm. Is our education system here prepared for that? Because I think no. this is what is uh, a lot of Well, you see, there is what I call an explosion of, of uh, information. information. There's an information the explosion. And you have the internet where you can, just at the press of a button, you can go around the whole Louvre, you can go around all the great yeah, galleries, yes. which yes. was not available to us. All we had when we were very young was that the art master in our school had about seven or eight books. Yes. And only the privileged amongst us were allowed to go and sit in that little yes. sitting space mm -hmm. and look through those books. That was our only exposure. There was one book on Van Gogh, there was maybe a book on Shergir. Uh, there were, that was our only exposure. And now the whole world is your oyster. Uh, that's wonderful because artists are being influenced by all sorts of things. Of course, there's a lot of plagiarization. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. But that uh, Indian art was ex accused of that uh, before as well. Uh, it was not uh, detected earlier because of lack of information and now it's... Yes. Uh, so there's a, there's a great explosion of information and in fact as far as I'm concerned I have to share the fact that I, when computers became uh, important. I did that one show with computers, but with some help from my son, who is a great computer nerd. Well, he doesn't like to be called a nerd. He said that the computers are very, very, you can be extremely creative, as is being proved now by all these youngsters. But that was early days. That was uh, as far back as 1999, uh, when no one else was doing it here. Uh, but having said that, I'm not really computer savvy myself. I refuse to uh, see the internet. Uh, I still write replies on a postcard because this is very deliberate. I didn't want uh, to be bombarded by data. In order to have, to be open to the muse, to be open to influences and to be open to inspiration. I mean, there's a lot of talk about inspiration. Where does it come from? I have to have a blank canvas in front of me, in my mind. I have to have a blank canvas in my mind. I don't want it to be cluttered with a thousand things and a thousand messages and a thousand images. Um, that's been very important. People think I'm completely crazy in this day and age. Uh, 
I mean, this is what I am talking about. You know, a lot of works you find that there is not too many influences working. So that creates a lot of noise mm. in, in the world. Mm. You are not able to decipher, you know, what, what the person is trying to say. Well, one of the, the ways that you judge uh, artist as having arrived or having uh, become mature is uh, knowing when to stop. And many of them don't, especially youngsters. They put all their thoughts, yeah. all their images into one painting. And it is noisy and, and confuses, yes. confusing. Yes, I agree with you there. Mm. Today there is an interview by the chairman of Southwise in Times of mm. India mm. and he says that Indian art is going to grow very yes. steadily. Yes. Uh, I'm sure he's talking in terms of uh, the economics the of ma art. The market. The market, the, yes. the art market as it's called. But how do you see Indian art grow? How do you see it? You know, we cannot really judge. I've said this time and again. Mm -hmm. We cannot judge without a distance of about 50 years. We cannot. Because I see many of the artists who were so sought after in the 50s. Now I have almost 50 years um, uh, that I can look back. I've been painting for 58 years. And uh, I have knowledge of art for, I'd say, about 40, 45 years, what was happening in the Indian art world. Some of the artists that were <coughs> absolutely a must to have, to know in the 50s are just disappeared from the uh, face of uh, the art world. You don't even hear about them. And uh, so I, I think there, there's always a great sifting that goes on, a great process of elimination, but also changing tastes. And. Uh, I think that's something we all have to ask ourselves also when we're doing a work of art. I asked all these youngsters, now you're doing something exciting here, somebody had done a fish in a bowl. Uh, how much of this will survive? How much of this will be relevant 10 years later? Forget 50. And I don't think any of us can judge. Will Hussein be as important as he is today in 50 years time? We can all make our um, guesses as to who will survive and who will not. Uh, but there are certain factors. Uh, we, I mean, people often talk of Subodh Gupta. Why has he hit the big time? And I think I'll tell you why. Yeah. Uh, European and Western art had kind of come to uh, an end. People said this is the end of art. A lot was written about the end of art. They came to the blank canvas mm. uh, of the canvas with the dot on it. It became totally minimalist. Then where do you go from that? And I think there was a kind of ennui, uh, boredom uh, with what was happening. Uh, galleries went on. Uh, after, for instance, let's just see in the American art scene. Since the great movement of American contemporary art, Nothing much has happened in the last, I would say nothing of any significance has happened in the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, the West has thrown up perhaps just Damien Hirst and Anish Kapoor. Mm -hmm. I can't think of anything else that's been thrown up recently that is of any lasting significance. So there was this question of looking out to India, looking to China, looking East, perhaps with a terrible thirst for something different and new. There was a th terrible thirst in the art world. And a person like Subodh satisfied that thirst. He had, to my mind, he has four factors that were so important. The first, unlike many installations that you see which are plagiarized from the West, mm -hmm. it was Indian. Yes. It was essentially mm -hmm. Indian. Yes. Second, it was urban. Mm -hmm. So urban. What's more urban than a stainless steel uh, dabba? Thirdly, it had scale. Mm -hmm. And fourthly, I think it had great wit. Yes. So he was bound to succeed with this amazing uh, excavation of objects and uh, trends, which was so Indian and so contemporary. He hit the world with it. And I'm not at all surprised that he's the one that uh, the world is talking about. But then uh, you can't buy this art. It it's not really all art is not meant to be bought, uh, but uh, the new art, A, which has huge scale, can only be bought by museums yes, yes. or very, very few 
extraordinarily rich people have large spaces because where would you put all this? And that's always been a, that's always been a, a problematic uh, for installation work. There's that great, great work by Judy Chicago, the dinner party, where it took 10 years for someone to actually build a space to house it. It was so large. I don't see that kind of patronage here. Uh, where people don't have museums of oh. that scale. Well, the, no museum in India has started to acquire contemporary art. The National Gallery in Delhi has completely failed. For ten years, they had no art purchase committee. This whole great new movement has been take, has taken place in Indian art. All these youngsters doing cutting edge stuff. Absolutely no acquisition. They're not in touch with what's happening. They're not in touch with what's happening. Galleries. Galleries have tried to promote. Yes. Also, I think installation art needs a different kind of promotion. It needs the promotion not only to sell it, but it certainly needs the promotion to make it. It's expensive yes. to make it. I mean, I saw an installation by Bose in New York where he had 24 or 25 computers and different things going on in each computer. It's very interesting. But I mean, to transport all that, to buy 24 computers, when the artist has to pay from his own pocket, it's not easy. It's not easy. So I think they have to think, to think more indigenous. That was what's so great about the Subodh. They were indigenous. It's very unique. Mm. Never done before. Yeah. Uh, one more thing that's been talked about, uh, not really talked about, reported by media, mm. is how artist is now not allowed to express himself or herself. The way you could paint nudes, mm. I don't think uh, a woman artist today, if she decides to paint nudes, it will be uh, easy for her. Uh, so are we going backwards? So we're just going backwards. We're going back, uh, spiraling into a medieval age. What should the artist do? I mean, should if you feel that somebody is breathing over your shoulder all the time, how do you then create? How, how can you really No, no, I think you just have to ignore it. And artists have to have the guts to just go ahead and do what they, are, they have to do. Uh, we have to resist any little fellow in the marketplace uh, points a finger but and you have to bring over. Because they, they don't want any kind of physical damage done to their property. It's galleries that compromise more than artists, I think. Uh, artists need but, galleries to but, that, but we come back to the whole thing of the commodification of art. Once it's become a commodity, as it has, unfortunately, uh, then it becomes important to save it from damage. Yes. But we've got to stand up. We can't capitulate to any fellow sitting in Nagpur and saying, I don't like this. Uh, we've, we've got to be a bit stronger. We've got to be stronger and we've got to be together. Uh, yes. We have to join together to say, no, we show what we want to show. Uh, Another thing is, you know, the whole parameter of successful art has become, you know, if you are sold by Sotheby's or Christie's or how much does uh, an artwork make? Well, I think that the great, at one time, you see, there was a lot of nouveau riche new buyers, which is important for the art world because when, say, when I was 18, only foreigners bought. There was no Indian buying going on. So, uh, Artists were really, you know, they were at that time really poor. They were not going around in a Mercedes like they are today. Uh, they were really, really poor. All of us were. We had no money. I remember one uh, exhibition soon after I was married where my husband bought 18 rupees worth of bamboo and nails and made all the frames, you know. So we've, we've all gone through that poverty phase. And of course, uh, when the boom took place, uh, many of the artists succumbed to this and said, my God, and why not? I mean, why should they go around on a bicycle? Why not be like everybody else and have a car and a decent house and send your children to a good school and so on? I mean, artists have material aspirations as well. Uh, they were not doomed to be paupers. Mm. But I think uh, because of this, uh, great boom which was really fueled by investors and not collectors. There's a big difference there. Uh, many artists just have succumbed to overproducing 
Yes. And the gallery has also got into the act of uh, heighten, heightening all the prices, giving the huge quantum jumps from 5 lakhs to 60 lakhs and 1 crore. Uh, so the art market went through this very volatile phase. But what goes up, the balloon has just burst. And uh, there has to be some sincerity in artists continuing to work in spite of the balloon having burst. Many of them who were lucky at the time of, of the boom and they were producing at the time of the boom made a lot of money. I know artists who have, I know one artist, friend of mine, who has got now 13 flats in the heart of Calcutta. You know, so people invested wisely, they built houses, they traveled, uh, the galleries were uh, pandering to all of us, taking us on fancy trips. All that's now more or less stopped. That's good. We've all come down to earth. Uh, so it, it goes through those phases. It'll come. I think it'll come up again. Uh, there are big, huge collections hitting the market. This Amaya collection, yes, really uh, which really was collected by a friend of uh, mine, uh, Amrita Javeri. Yes. Now, Amrita is an interesting story because yeah. her father mm -hmm. was my biggest collector. Okay. And uh, he has more paintings, poor man, he's passed away. Mm -hmm. But they have more paintings of mine than I have in my own collection. Really? And so Amrita grew up with all these paintings. Mm -hmm. And I had managed to persuade her father, then who's a jeweler, mm -hmm. uh, why don't you collect other people, don't just collect me. Mm -hmm. So I helped him to make collections of Husseins and uh, certainly of two or three wonderful Brutas and uh, of other painters, Jogen. And so Amrita grew up with art, and then of course she married uh, one of the directors of Sotheby's, or the who was the director of Sotheby's, and they built up an extraordinary collection. So only day before yesterday, I was with her mother, and was told that this Amaya collection was coming up, but she's putting that whole collection uh, on the market. I don't know why she's named it Amaya. I thought it would be Amrita or something. It had to be a name, I suppose. You have to name a collection. Well, that's part of the spin doctors must have said you need to. Uh, I don't really know this word, so I was wondering what does it mean? What is Amaya? It's mean just a name, I think. I'm not sure what it means. I mean, I, I just encountered it yesterday, uh, day before yesterday, for the first time. But I've seen some of the images. They certainly had made a very good collection. Yes. Yeah. I want to know how do you keep reinventing yourself? What is that source? Because you have to keep on going back to that source and find something new, how does that happen? I think one has to be, I know it sounds so silly for a 73 year old woman to say this, but in some way you have to A, retain your blank canvas and B, uh, you have to have a certain innocence. Mm -hmm. And I think many Indian women are a little innocent. I think maybe I'm a Possibly, I don't know if I'm innocent, but I'm certainly sometimes a bit naive. So you're open, that way you're much more open to the influ influences that you experience, mm -hmm. not something that you're seeing in a book mm -hmm. or on the screen, but uh, there's a certain metamorphosis between experiencing something and then finally seeing it uh, perhaps in a different form on the canvas. And there's usually a gap of about six or seven months. Uh, like I must have been inspired in that exhibition of furniture, mm -hmm. just by seeing a piece of junk somewhere and saying, I remember how it happened. I was in Madras and I'm one of those restless people. I have to paint every day of my life. Otherwise, I feel the day is not complete. Uh, and I had, no pa I had nothing to paint on. There was no canvas, there was no board. And I was at a friend's house in Chennai, and there was this chair lying there, and she said, don't be so restless, paint the chair. So I painted the chair, and then a critic came in the afternoon, a friend of hers, mm -hmm. who said, wow, why don't you do a whole set of uh, these chairs? Mm -hmm. So that's how it began. So I think that inspiration comes uh, in such strange ways. You never know what is going to uh, catch the imagination of the spark. artist or to spark off a new uh, set of work. 
uh, for instance, now these flying figures were inspired by my friend Astad Debu, who is a dancer. And after one of his performances, I began to paint these flying figures. Uh, he had those drummers from uh, Meghala, I think it is, young drummers, and they all jump and fly. Uh, so uh, I was very inspired by that. I don't know what will inspire me tomorrow. Uh, so it's very difficult to say how you move from one phase to the other. But as I said before, one of the factors in doing that transition is to have the courage to abandon what everyone likes. Uh, um, you just now mentioned an art critic friend of yours. Mm -hmm. What has happened to art criticism and uh, do you think uh, it has, it's now over, there is no art criticism? Oh, there is. There's huge art criticism. In fact, I, I read Tom Wolfe, uh, mm -hmm. who was the satirist who mocked at critics. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that was in the context of the, the American art movement. Mm -hmm where he said that eventually you'll only have walls of text and text and text and postage st stamp size paintings. And that is possibly true, uh, that uh, artists today don't seem to be the uh, writers, the critics, the curators have really taken over the scene. And young artists don't have the courage to just put their work on the wall without this great endorsement uh, from the so-called uh, art critics and writers. And the art critics and writers uh, seem to, uh, it's very much uh, the emperor's new clothes mm -hmm. uh, syndrome because their power seems to lie in the complete impossibility of their text which no one can understand. Yes. <laughs> so in, by baffling people totally, uh, they're exerting a kind of uh, power over the hapless uh, reader. reader or buyer uh, who without this text uh, does not know what to make of this painting. And so often the text has nothing whatever to do with the painting. So there's a lot of that going on. Of course we have very serious uh, critics. Uh, I can name at least five in India who I think are so important. Uh, Kalidas for one. I like the way he he analyzes things in a very deep sense. There's Gayatri Sinha, uh, who writes with a certain clarity. But I think the most wonderful of them all is K.G. Subramanyam, who is both a practitioner yes. uh, of art and a great writer, uh, critic, uh, art historian. Uh, I think his texts read like the Bible of Indian art. Uh, I don't think any, anyone has written with such clarity as him or continues to write with such clarity. So there are people who, but there are a lot who just verbalize uh, a lot of jargon. with a lot of jargon. To confuse it. Yes. Well, that's all part of the whole scene. I think, um, you see, if you look at this whole art market as a kind of triumvirate where you have the artist, the dealer and the writer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a triangle. I always say that the work of art, uh, the creation of that work of art is the event. That is the important event. Mm -hmm. After that, it's taken, it's framed, it's bought, it's sold. There's so many other players who come I into the scene and uh, influence the final outcome of that work of art. Nothing to do with the artist. Nothing to do with the artist. He's been interpreted, yes. he's been shown, his prices have been taken from here to there or there to here. Uh, it's a huge manipulation of what I'd call the periphery art market or the periphery art scene, peripheral art scene, yeah. And uh, artists at the, at the core of it, it's your creation. And I think artists have to also have the courage to say, it's my creation, I will interpret it. Who are you to interpret my work? But uh, often they don't have the verbal skills or literary skills to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, succumb to this kind of... Uh, I don't even know whether people read these texts. You know, I have lots of catalogs landing on my doorstep. And to be very frank, 
after I've read the first paragraph, which if it seems to be pointing in some sensible direction, I will read the rest of it. Otherwise, I will not read it. I will look at the visuals mm -hmm. and judge for myself. But I think uh, people need that endorsement. Yeah, uninitiated, they need some mm. kind of entry point and they, mm. they understand words mm. rather than... Many mm. people do not understand the visual language. Mm. Thanks for talking to us and uh, I want to thank you personally because I think your works have enriched our lives aesthetically and have given a lot of meaning to it. Well, I don't know whether aesthetics itself has become a dirty word. <laughs> uh, yes, and that's all those of us, now. those who are of us who are still wedded to aesthetics, are in a very strange niche of our own. We are in a strange niche where we are still wedded to aesthetics. We are not being moved from one end to the other. The uh, same way, art lovers are also, you know, those who are wedded to aesthetics. Mm. They are, they are also in a flux. They don't understand mm. what kind of art uh, per se, and who decides, you know, what is good art. The yeah. artist, the viewer, the collector, or the gallery, or the art critic. <laughs> yes. Good art is that uh, art that gives you joy. Well, that's not necessarily true. I think. Uh, like when you let's look at the great modern movements, mm -hmm. uh, you let's, let's look at the, at the no. daddy of the wall, Picasso. Mm -hmm. The paintings he did did not necessarily give joy. Yeah, they don't. Uh, but he broke new ground, saying, uh, "I don't have to paint pretty pictures. There has to be some other kind of content." And I think that is. Uh, that's overtaking Indian art, thank God, where the content matters, not simply uh, uh, pretty pictures. I mean, that has been, some of the young people have criticized Sher Shergil on that ground. That is, her work is so utterly beautiful, so utterly beautiful. You cannot ever say that there's a, a single jarring note there's no deconstruction, there's no, uh, there's no angst, there's no pain, there's no anger. But all these are elements that also have to be expressed. Uh, satire, anger, pain. But isn't it the artist who decides what he or she wants to show? No, what, what he wants to express is more important uh, than what he wants to show. But those factors are now as important as uh, beauty. Beauty is only one of the factors that yes, uh, yes. guide what artists are doing. Uh, the aspiration for beauty is sometimes very small. The aspiration for meaning is much greater, is much, much greater. Yeah, I saw work at India Art uh, Fair. This Bangladesh woman, she had made a crib for her daughter. Mm, I saw that. Blades. I saw that, yes. Uh, yeah, I thought that was great work. Mm. Yes. I mean, if, if you take I saw that. meaning to that level, then of course... No, but much of it, is. much of the things that you're seeing are to that level. I mean, like me too using yeah, human Mitchell. hair. Yes. Uh, that has so many uh, reverberations, so many connotations beyond what you're seeing on the canvas. Uh, the whole women's issue, the whole gender issue is being almost done to death in, in the whole art scene. But. Uh, but it's it important die. to do. It shouldn't die. It shouldn't die. It shouldn't yeah. die because it, it's, it's alive. It's, mm. it's there in everyday life. Mm. Women face it every day. Mm. So there's the other reality. The other reality must also be expressed. And not, not as... I mean, there were people in the Bengal school who uh, romanticized poverty. You had... I mean, if you've been a village woman carrying a heavy pot of water on your head, it's not romantic, but these idyllic uh, rural uh, romances that were portrayed mm -hmm. were completely uh, self-indulgent, completely uh, escapist, that you were escaping from the horrible reality of having to trudge on cracked feet uh, 20 miles to get a pot of water. So those uh, things have to be addressed, broken. Uh, challenged. 
So there's a lot of challenge going on. That, yes. That's a good thing. You know, Art Info, uh, you know, came out with uh, with a list of. I mean, they have their own parameters of the most uh, uh, outstanding works in the last five years. Mm. They they created a list of hundred works, and there's not a single canvas in that. Mm. There are a couple of photographs, mm. but not a single canvas. Yeah, photography is taking over big. Yeah, because in a way, it's become so easy also. Technology is there yeah. to help yeah. you. You can manipulate yeah. it so many ways. Yeah, I mean, people like us are dinosaurs. We are, we are dinosaurs. We haven't. There's a lot of us who haven't addressed technology for what it could uh, yield. It could yield uh, much more if one, if one sort of has a feeling of it's a bit too late now. I don't have time to learn all this. Uh, no, but it's beautiful about you know. I, I usually, I mean, in literature, I find that women actually never had a larger canvas to mm -hmm. it because men naturally have more exposure mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they create large canvases. But women have more depth. Mm -hmm. You had this choice. I mean, you you has you had this huge canvas. You mm -hmm. have seen the world, but you you choose your own niche, niche, and that's yeah. beautiful. I think you have to do that because uh, I think we also paint a little in isolation. I don't particularly like the big world. I like the small world. I'm very attached to the small world, and the small world is my inspiration. The small world is uh, what feeds me, uh, what nurtures me, and I acknowledge that. I mean, I see that in Frida Kahlo's work. How small her world was, with all its pain and angst, and how marvelous, and that great big bullying husband of hers. Uh, horrid looking fellow. Huh? I feel that <laughs> she had the guts and the courage to express herself. Devo was only expressing great revolutionary ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he was expressing himself. It's like only Tolstoy can write war and peace. Mm. Yes, you're right. Woman would never attempt that. Yeah. The great yeah. canvas. Huh? Yeah, great canvas. Women will write God of small things. <laughs> which is such a which wonderful book. I wish she'd I wish she'd write more yeah, novels instead it's of such a pity she is all her. Oh, she's going in a funny direction. What a wonderful book that was. Yeah. I think that's this is what happens to some women, you know, they try to become men, to become activists, to have a larger role in your life, to play. This this is also these are also influences that work on different ways on women. Mm -hmm. I think one could talk endlessly about gender oh, yes. issues. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's a pleasure talking to you. Once Thank you. Me. Thank it you. was so nice talking to you too. I mean, I've done most of the talking. I would like to know more about you. <laughs> so I, I want to talk more actually. There's so much to talk. Mm -hmm.